All right. Now, welcome, welcome, welcome to another yeah. fabulous episode of My Orgasmic Life. Mm. I'm your hostess, Gaia Morissette. And today, um, first of all, before we get into, you know, introducing my co-host, my sexy co-host, um, a little bit of housekeeping things. So first of all, today's episode is brought to you by Tickle.life. <laughs> Also, um, as a reminder, if you are inspired, if you laugh, if you grow, if you learn from my orgasmic life, I need your support. As I show up for you guys, I need you guys to start showing up for me, okay? And you can do that by sharing with your friends how My Orgasmic Life is the podcast to be listening to, um, as well as you can, you know, for $5 donation, you can help the overhead costs of running My Orgasmic Life. So, all right, let's get into our juicy conversation today. So, I always like my guests to introduce who they are, what they do in the world, um, and pronounce your name properly because I'm dyslexic and I'm horrible at everybody's name. All right. (laughs) So, my sexy guest, what's your name? My name is Jennifer Ronner. I am a sexuality educator. That's probably the big umbrella term. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I would say my primary focus is on helping vulva owners to experience more pleasure. Um, And we got the opportunity to meet, we've done two podcasts together, episodes actually on Tickle.Life's podcast. So um, if you really want to learn more about Jennifer um, in her own personal, very personal story. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, that, that's a lot more. <laughs> we, uh, we actually did, uh, we did a story about her sexual awakening um, was one episode, and then another episode, which I don't think is aired yet, no. um, okay. about uh, her experience in, you know, when she first met Betty Dobson and her journey into awakening her orgasmic experience. So, um, which is what I want, who I want to talk about, seeing that, you know, in honor of Betty and, and the work that she's done, and as she's recently passed, um, going back, moving on to her next adventure, um, adventure. Where, where do you want to start? Like, you want to talk to me about the first time you met her, your relationship with her? Um, yeah, I mean, we can go all over the place. The, the first thing that I'm, in, that, that I'm inspired to say is that Betty always said that death was the final orgasm and that she was looking forward to it. So it's been, um, it's been challenging this 10 days. I think it's been 10 days, um, Mm -hmm. just about, um, and, you know, challenging for me personally, challenging for the community of others who have learned from Betty and who have kind of been in her orbit, um, but, uh, you know, we're all kind of coming to grips with it. And I think one kind of overriding theme for many of us is that we need to step up, that Betty was such a force of nature. You know, she was out there and such a symbol to vulva owners, particularly, that they could grab their pleasure by the balls mm-hmm. and take it and deserved it. And, and while she was here with us, I I mean, I think a number of us have kind of been like, yeah, we learned from Betty. We're, you know, we're doing our class and we're doing, we're talking to the people in our lives. But for me, for a few other people that I've talked to now we're like, okay, we have to fill that big fucking void that she left. Mm -hmm. And, and it's huge, you know, and that's why I think it's going to take so many of us to even do it justice. So, um, and that's so beautiful, you know, so for everybody who happens to be listening right now live and, and let's, let's talk about who Betty is. Like, let's give a little bit of background in case they're like, who's this Betty woman that they keep talking about? I I think you're going to hear a lot more about her now. And isn't it always the case that when you, you know, when someone's gone, then all of a sudden she's everywhere and people are like, how, how did I not know about this person? Yeah. Um, Betty 
is called the she was called the mother and the grandmother and the fairy godmother of female orgasm she's yes. been um teaching in her new york city apartment for the last 50 years yeah. um, teaching techniques to experience orgasm to experience pleasure um it came out of her involvement in kind of the you know the the swinging 60s you know into the 70s free love uh sexual exploration she was noticing that while women were involved in these group sex orgy situations um they were still performing for men mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they weren't actually experiencing pleasure of their own yeah um so she so she started taking women back into her room and showing them how to get off after they just performed their orgasm in the group scene <laughs> nice <laughs> and that's kind of how everything started um in the 70s there were a lot of consciousness raising groups you know yes. with the feminist movement and and betty realized early on that until we had control over our sexuality and um and believed in the power of our sexuality that that we wouldn't really be equal yeah um so that's where she focused and her consciousness raising groups included talking about sex and they made a lot of people very uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, on, on one hand, I think it's, it's, it's a little sad that 50 years later, these kinds of conversations are still making people uncomfortable. Um, yeah, it is sad. However, that being she said, was one of the ones to start it, you know. She, so and it's, she, yeah, she did. She like she was the one was like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> Brave this. Let's, let's get her done. It's time to like look at this, and it was radical. Like it was incredibly right. radical. I mean, the fact that you and I are on a public forum live right now, having a conversation about orgasm, about pleasure, about female right. or, or the vulva owned you know, pleasure. This is like, would never, ever, 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 ever have happened back then. And so like, she was a radical, you know? I mean, if I think about uh, Betty's, Betty's been doing this work my whole life. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I, like, I never lived in a world without her influence. Yeah. Um, certainly when I was younger, I wasn't feeling that influence at all. I don't think a lot of us were, especially if like we weren't growing up in uh, cosmopol more cosmopolitan areas, you know, instead we were hearing a bunch of stuff about, you know, our, 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 our hands getting hairy from masturbation and it's a sin and don't do it. Um, but I, I, masturbation, giving yourself pleasure is I think one of the best things that one of the healthiest things that we can do for ourselves in so many ways oh yeah it's like the source of like our pleasure our our power our you know it doesn't matter what genitals you have right you being able to master what you what arouses you and you know turns you on and and all the exploration and the safety and the the creativity and all of those pieces are like the foundation i know that when i'm teaching that is like masturbation self-pleasure self-discovery is the foundational tool of the key ingredient to being a full well-rounded happy human being and definitely is a key ingredient in your sexuality if Absolutely. you want to have an epic sexual life then you need to start with you yeah absolutely if you don't know what brings you pleasure how can you expect anybody else to figure it out yeah and i actually let's talk about masturbation okay <laughs> yes i feel i feel inspired and after <laughs> our call i am totally gonna go have some self-love time <laughs> this wasn't Facebook, we could just start now. But I know, right, but it's inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and we need to have race consent, you know, there's all these you things, you know, right? Um, I did bring my Volvo with me. <laughs> you're, you're one that's attached to you or the one that's not attached to you? <laughs> oh, there you go, the nice puppet, <laughs> the Volvo puppet. <laughs> I have my Volvo. <laughs> I can talk about how to how to pleasure vulva. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about your 
your own experience with masturbation. Oh, wow. I have some stories. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So let's start with in, like in the beginning. In the beginning, when you first started, like what were your messaging? What was your messaging that you got as a kid around self-pleasure and masturbation? Well, first I'm going to say thanks, mom and dad. Seriously. They were great. I didn't get a lot of, at least in my home, I did not get the bullshit messages that there was something wrong or or dirty about giving yourself pleasure. Mm -hmm. Um, As an early masturbator, (laughs) surprised, right? Um, So, uh, (laughs) you you know, uh, the first time that I, the first thing I remember um, around masturbation is, is my mother asking me why I was doing something. And I, I used to lay on my back and kind of spread my legs and rock. Um, and she asked me why I was doing that. And I told her it was to get that feeling. Nice. And she said, what feeling? And I said, there, that feeling. Mm-hmm. And I think I said like the tickly feeling or something to that effect. I don't, you know, I don't remember verbatim, but I do remember my mother saying, okay, that's, um, that's, that's something that you can do for yourself. And um, usually people do it in private and you probably shouldn't do it in front of the relatives because they won't understand. Oh, well, that's good. That was like, well, that was well done. Way that to was- go, your mom. My mom, that was, that was one of the first messages that I got around masturbation was it was okay. Maybe you shouldn't do it in the living room during Thanksgiving dinner, but, <laughs> but it was not a bad thing. So, uh, so nice. I did feel pr- very empowered from an early age to, um, explore my own pleasure, um, which came in really handy later in life when I was trying to figure out the whole sex thing, um, Yeah. Yeah, And like, I'd like to share my, like what it was like for me. Um, So, you know, I also, you know, I give props to my, my mom, I'm going to give a shout out to my mom that, you know, she, she did this very, very well. Um, In our household, um, the belief system was, if you want to know how to teach your partner to give you pleasure, you must know what gives yourself pleasure. So I remember like, you know, so it was totally okay for us to uh, go explore our bodies, to have pleasure. Again, it was that, you know, not in front of the family and not Thanksgiving, you know, this is a thing that happens in your private, you know, in your own bedroom. Um, but that the, that there was like this, it was an interesting message. Like on one hand, I'm grateful for the message, but if I were to dive into it even a little bit deeper, like there was this kind of, there still was the belief system that I was in training so that I could be a good lover. Yes. So it's really fascinating because it's like, well, why do, why am I in training that I need to be a good lover for my partner. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think it's great. It is true. It's a true statement. If you don't know what you like, you can't communicate it to somebody else to get your needs met. But it was that, that premise that around the training part that I found now, I've never even thought about it until this moment. that uh, That is interesting because it is, it's more, at least with me, it was the same way. It was more about, um, about being able to communicate with your partner or please your partner and not about uh, it, having a relationship with yourself and your own sexuality. Yeah. And being yeah. able to fulfill your own needs. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was, it was like, well, you're in training so that you can communicate it instead of being like, this is yours and you get to have it and you get to share it if you want to, and, but you don't have to share it. And like, this is your power, like that place of, you know, coming back to that place of that our right that we deserve to have sexual gratification and sexual pleasure. And that's our right. And we can choose to share it. We can choose to have it. We can allow other people to participate. Uh, like, you know. But it, at the end of the day, it's 
ours and yeah. it's ours to have that relationship with and ours to have that connection with. And, you know, if, you know, even when I taught, so, so I, in my house, I became the sexual educator. Like, it's like my mother gave me all the, the sexual education. And then I'm like the oldest of six kids. So oh, wow. then, so then she's like, mm, I'm not, I don't have to talk to them about that. Go talk to your sister. So every time any of them were like started into a relationship, started to look like they might need the sex talk. My mom was like, go talk to your sister. <laughs> When I gave the, you know, sex, sex education to my siblings, um, which are some really funny stories that we'll have to do on another show. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's their own fault that they don't actually listen to my podcast. So <laughs> I'm going to divulge information about them. So that serves them right. <laughs> um, anyways. So I passed on that same construct though. Like I passed on the whole construct that yes, sex was important for you to understand what you liked and what you didn't like and why you liked it and why you didn't like it. But again, there still was that theme of so that you could tell somebody else. So if I were to do it differently, like if I were to give sex education to my siblings or any kid, like adolescence and, and stuff like that, I would definitely change that phrasing. I would definitely yeah. change the phrasing of that. Yes, you want to know this for you. And yes, it's great when you know this, you can communicate it if you choose to communicate it with others. But that's not the purpose of why no. you want to explore your pleasure. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's for you. And the, you know, the, the, the first and primary sexual relationship you have is with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there have been times in my life when that's been just fine. Like, that's been enough. In fact, like early on when I was, when I was first having partner sex, I was more like, I would leave partner sex frustrated hadn't really had an orgasm maybe had some pleasure but hadn't had an orgasm or you know and didn't didn't know how to communicate my needs but i would then go home and and and, and experience pleasure myself with myself because i got really good at that <laughs> um and you know I, I said mom and dad because my message from dad came a little later but um he knew that i was sexually active mm -hmm. and he actually sat me down one morning and surprised me with a vibrator. I was, I wow. was in, my, in my late teens. I'm sitting there. It's like a Saturday morning, right? I'm sitting there with my coffee, just kind of trying to wake up. And all of a sudden dad's like, and puts it in front of me. And it's one of those, you know, do you remember the old school molded white plastic vibrators that yes. took two D batteries and you screwed in the bottom? Yeah. That's what it was. He kind of stood it up on end in front of me and I'm like looking at it like, holy shit. <laughs> What's going down now? But dad had this whole conversation with me about, about knowing myself. Mm. Knowing myself before I allowed anybody else to know me in that sense. Mm. I mean, he knew I, that I was, but he was like, it's, it is so important for you to know yourself and you should be more focused on that relationship than the ones that you're having with all of these boys. That's awesome. Yay, dad. Way to Yay, go, dad. dad. Yay, dad. I know, like for me too, like it's interesting as you were talking about it, I was thinking about the, my first vibrator and my first vibrator was given to me by my best friend who was to keep me out of trouble. So <laughs> <laughs> again, it's really fascinating. This is a really fascinating conversation. I, I'm like thinking about stuff I have never really thought about and put them together. <laughs> so like, this is a really great conversation. Um, so I had been masturbating and exploring since I was 11, 11 years old, uh, even younger than that. But like, you know, to really consciously, like, I know it's an orgasm and I'm choosing it and all that kind of stuff. So I'm about 11 years old. And, um, and then I found boys and then I'm having partner sex, which I started when I was 14. 
so now I'm having partner sex and I'm getting pleasure and, and all this stuff is going really great. But then I would go into, and I'm still masturbating, but you know, again, old school with your hand and, you know, or finding implements. That was the other thing is that finding <laughs> oh, to get myself off, um, <laughs> which, you know, and then feeling guilty and bad and shamed about the fact that I was finding these implements and utilizing them for sexual gratification, you know? Phallic vegetables. Exactly. You know, like, bottles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I used to take a, you remember the, the old wire, um, hangers? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So I was very clitoral focused. I wasn't sticking stuff up inside me. Right. So, so just for clarification. So I would take the flat, like the, the long straight edge. Mm -hmm. I would put that between my labia and then I would put it in like my panties. So there would be pressure pushed up against, and then I would just take the top and flick it back and forth. And so it would rub my, my clitoris back and forth, back and forth. Right. So that was an ingenious thing that I did. Um, <laughs> so you, as, and your friend got, oh got yeah, back to my vibrant. friend. Sorry. I got somebody else was making a comment. Um, okay. So here's a, a, somebody that's with us. Uh, I gave my oldest sister her first vibrator at 35. I almost fell over when she said she had never had one. Oh. So first of all, great sister, great sister move. And I bet you your sister is so happy <laughs> that she finally got to experience it. So, okay. So my first vibrator is from my best friend who's male, who I wouldn't, he was like the only male in my life that didn't get any action from me. <laughs> and... <laughs> because I was very toxic back then. I had a lot of trauma. I didn't realize I had a lot of trauma. I was a sexual tsunami. Um, basically, I was like this wake of destruction in my path around my sexual expression and my sexuality. And so well, I didn't- You and I have so much in common. It's I know, that's why, we, that's why, that's why we get along. Um, <laughs> so, so I would go through these phases where- um, my lust would be my arousal and now I know what it is, but I didn't know that. And I was, I would, this lust would come over me and I couldn't control all I, no matter how many orgasms, no matter how much I fucked, no matter, it didn't satisfy, it didn't stop me. Um, I made bad life decisions and it would go for like a, and I would have it in, it was like in, um, cycles. So it would be like that for a month. A month of where I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, like it was like I was uh, out of control. Mm -hmm. So my best friend decides the way to help me through this process is he's going to go get me a vibrator. Now, we lived in this tiny little northern town in Ontario, okay? <laughs> and there's only one sex toy store in the region that happens to be in our little town and everybody knows who walks in there and who doesn't walk in there and then it's gossip so he risked his reputation oh. to walk in there to go and then have very uncomfortable conversations with the woman who runs the store and so this woman's like, well, has she ever had a vibrator? She's like, I don't know. She's my friend. <laughs> I don't think so. I know that she can't seem to control herself. So is there something that can help her with that? <laughs> so so he, she pulls out like a fist and pulls out like a huge, you know, dog. And then pulls out like all these things. And he's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Finally, he fi she pulls out like a little bullet. Remember the the little bullets? And back then they weren't wireless. So they had like a little wire attached to like a, you know, a uh -huh. controller, right? So he buys me the bullet. And he decides that he's going to give it to me for Christmas. So we're at my family's. And, and we do Christmas morning at my family's. And he put it underneath the Christmas tree. And one of the things in my family is that one of the you know, usually one of my siblings was like the elf and would hand out the pick the, the presents to each person. And then we all sat in a circle and one person opened their present and while well, everybody watched them. Yep. 
So my best friend hadn't realized that 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 present had been now given to me in the circle with all of my parents, my parents and my siblings, right? We're like family circle opening up the Christmas gifts. <laughs> and I like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, it's from Dave, right? Which is my best friend. I'm like, oh, and he's like, what? No. <laughs> and he jumps across the room, grabs the present out of my hand. And he's like, this is not the appropriate place to open this. <laughs> so, like, so you just reminded me of a story, which also involves my dad, which is, which, which will show you my dad's sense of humor and where I get mine from. And so I opened, so he's like, you can't open this in front of everybody. I'm like, okay, let's go upstairs. So I leave the, so my family's still like, what is it? What is it? I'm like, it's none of your business, right? <laughs> so I go upstairs, I open it up and I'm like, and I'm looking at this thing that I don't even know what it is. I'm like, what is this? He's like, it's a vibrator. I'm like, what do you do with it? <laughs> he's like, well, the woman told me, cause we're young. Like we're like, we're like 17, 18 years old. Like we're quite young, right? I mean, he, technically I don't think he was old enough to go into the sex toy store, right? Mm, yeah. And so, so I'm like, well, what do you do with it? He's like, well, the woman told me that you put it on your clitoris. <laughs> I'm like right on and that I never have never gone back uh that was the <laughs> beginning of my sex toy uh, long life of adventures with sex toys and I called him Bob battery operated boyfriend, boyfriend. <laughs> I so after my dad gave me the vibrator and I was 16 when that happened after he gave me the vibrator I was dating this guy who came over for Christmas Eve right so where, you know, we have Christmas Eve dinner and I know it was me and the boyfriend and my dad and my stepmom and I don't even remember if anyone else was there, but my dad pulls this package out from under the tree and hands it to me. And it's about this big, like it's a box about this big and it's got a pack. Okay, so of, for everybody who's listening that can't see what you said, so how foot, about a foot long? Okay. It's about a foot long, right? Okay. And, 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 and long, long box. Yeah. Um, and it has a pack, like a four pack of double D batteries taped to the outside of it. <laughs> so my dad hands this to me and says, go ahead, open it. And I'm like, I am not, like, I'm looking at the boyfriend going, I'm not opening that. I'm not, I'm not opening that. Dad, I'm not going to. And he's like, come on, come on, come on. And he like, he starts, he starts ripping it. And I'm like, fine. And I grab it from him and rip it up. It was an umbrella. <laughs> And I'm looking at my dad and I'm like, why did you take batteries to an umbrella? Like, you know, and he's like, and he's, you know, twinkle in his eye. He's just like, everybody needs batteries. <laughs> nice. Okay. So we could talk for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. About everything. Yeah. About everything. So what is the one, so let's start with what's the one thing that Betty Dobson brought to your life? God. Um, the most enduring thing was that message that that masturbation truly was for me. Um, her, well, she wrote several books and pamphlets throughout the 70s, but her first published book, Sex for One, uh, which was, I love and read and it's awesome. Yes. I think, I I think that came out in 1987. Mm -hmm. So that was my late teens. Um, I found it a year or two after that. So I was 18 or 19 when I found that book. And I was one of those kids who would go to the library and like check out a stack of 10 books and just like devour them in a week. So and, and at that point in time, I was reading like whatever I could about sex because I was fascinated. I've always been fascinated. But I found that book. I read it. I was like, oh my God, this is something. I returned the library book and then I went out and bought it, mm -hmm. you know? And I had a copy of that with me throughout my, my early adulthood. Um, I think I gave that first copy away. I, I, like, I've had this like, you know, uh, habit of when I find a book that really speaks to me, I always give them away and then and I end up buying a new one. So I'm, I, that, I'm on like probably my like, 27th copy of sex for one because i give them to people who need it 
Um, but I would say now the most important thing is the sisterhood of people that I've met all over the world um, who have all have all been in Betty's gravitational pull. Um, and certainly the most important right now because um, we have been, gosh, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, we've been meeting every Sunday. Um, and it fluctuates how many people are there, but we all get on a Zoom call on Sunday afternoons. You know, sometimes there's like 20 of us, other times there's like 60 of us. And it's literally all over the world. I think we've had, I think we've had people from just about every continent nice. on the call. Um, we get together, we catch up and we masturbate together. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it is an absolutely wonderful self-soothing ritual during a time when the world feels so crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and last weekend, um, uh, when Betty passed away on Halloween, which is another just great witchy thing. Um, we all feel like she chose that day on purpose. But we, we had our, our circle the next day. And it was, you know, it was kind of a, it was a little bit of a memorial wake kind of thing. And so perfect. Um, there are actually a bunch of us who are doing this 40 days for bad um hashtag 40 days for bad uh betty's initials were betty ann dodson b-a-d so everyone called her bad she's a badass she's you know nice. uh, so a, a bunch of us are masturbating self-pleasuring daily um nice. for 40 days as a way to honor her and the work that she did um so can people get in on that how do people get in on that there's an Instagram account called 40 days for bad and, and on just share, you know, you can, if you're sharing either on Instagram or other places, use the hashtag 40 days for bad. Um, uh, and, you know, some of us are posting like our, our post orgasmic expressions. Some of us are like posting pictures of the rumpled sheets or uh, you know uh, the toys that we used or, something that reminds us of her. Um, and you know, like Betty was, she was really all about helping women figure out orgasm. Um, and I think, I think even that has kind of been a male centric practice because I, I don't necessarily think that, that a self-pleasure practice has to include orgasm. Um, self-pleasure self -pleasure can be uh, giving yourself the time and space to take a bath mm -hmm. or, or touch yourself in a non-sexual way. Mm -hmm. um, so pleasure, pleasure. a lot of things. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so how can, what would you have taught, what, what would you have said to your younger self about masturbation that you didn't know then that you know now? I, I would have, I would have told my younger self that it's okay to take the time to learn yourself before involving anybody else mm -hmm. in, in, in your pleasure. Um, not that that was a bad thing. I don't, I don't really have any regrets. I had kind of the same drives that you were describing. Uh, what did you call it? A sexual tsunami? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, if you ask my husband, he'll probably tell you I still do at times. <laughs> Every After, day. After years of tantra training, of learning how to harness my sexual energy, contain my sexual energy, and be consensual with my sexual energy, I am no longer a tsunami unless I consciously choose to. <laughs> yeah, I might need to hire you. But... All right. You can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> talk about that later. Um... Um, okay. So I would like to say about the thing I would have told the younger me is that pleasure is your right and all the pleasure possibilities is the key to your empowerment mm. instead of the shame that was imposed culturally societally religiously 
around me. So I had a safe containment space. You know, we both of us talked about our safe containment space at home, but externally, the large there, largely there was not like a safe containment space for, you know, I heard about, oh, boys will be boys, but there was no like girls will be girls. Like, right. oh, look, she's horny. Girls will be girls. I was not, I was like, no, that it's whore. That That's whore. Fun. She's a slut. <laughs> you know, she's a troll up. Um, you know, like my, that source of my pleasure and my sexuality. And, and that's what I would have told myself now. I mean, I, I'm, un, I'm un, uh, apologetic for my divine sexual self now. And I wish that I could have given that to the little younger version of me. Um, she would have had a much easier time if she didn't have to struggle with that internal shame and that internal judgment and that internal um the only way that I could have my sexuality is if it was through a man all of those things um you know which is not where I live and haven't lived in a very long time but younger me that's where I lived and I, I wish I could have had that I mean I learned all the stuff that I learned and I could show up in the world and I understand all that stuff but that's the one gift that I would have given to myself the interesting thing, though, is, I, I mean, and I think the, the people who get, you know, to where you and I are in terms of sexuality, we all have these stories about the struggle and about, um, you know, figuring it out for ourselves. So would we be the people that we are without the degree of struggle that we had? And I'm not well, saying that we shouldn't pave the way for uh, others. <laughs> for others to have it a bit easier Here, yes but you know but i i, I guess i guess it, it you know it's the time where we need this sort of intensity to change the culture well and, and like i said i i don't regret it you're right the experiences of that we have make up who we are and how we show up in the world and what we do and how who we are um you know, I always like doing this little conversation because it helps the audience, obviously, most of the time. It helps the audience being like, oh, I didn't know that, or I'm still moving from that place. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it helps. I find that, that that's that piece about relatability to us in our journey is because, you know, majority of people, the average people around the world are still sitting at those places of shame. Yeah. They're still sitting at those places of, you know, it's not safe for Volvo owners to embrace their sexuality, to embrace their pleasure, um, you know, depending on where you're living in the world and what circumstances, it actually may not actually be physically safe right. um, for you to embrace that. And so I, I just want to give some space and a shout out to any woman, any vulva owner that is in a space where it's like, yeah, well, that's great, but I can't openly talk about that because it's dangerous. Then you need to honor that place. I honor you for that place and I'm holding space for you in, in any capacity that I that you might need um just as Jennifer I'm sure without putting words in her mouth um <laughs> absolutely I yeah. mean and you know it's it, it's weird to talk about benefits of the pandemic but I can tell you one that I've seen is how many amazing supportive and and safe and brave spaces have sprung up virtually that are accessible um, if you've got a connection to the internet, you can pretty much uh, participate in these. Um, you know, we're doing body sex circles virtually um, to help women learn more about, or vulva owners learn more about how to experience pleasure. Uh, there's um, there's a lot of people doing work around sexual stories right now too. That's fascinating, and 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 it is this this kind of storytelling thing and finding commonalities with each other um, and telling our truths so that it's different mm -hmm. further on down the road because we didn't hear these kinds of stories when we were coming up no. No. you know all my friends came over to our house to learn about sex education because we certainly weren't getting it in school and i was like that you know um okay so how can people spend more time with you jennifer they want to be like oh i want more jennifer how do they get there well um, you can find me at bodysexbyjennifer.com. That is my solo practice. Um, if you want to find out more about me, it's at jenniferronner.com. 
Um, and that kind of links you to everything else that I'm doing. <laughs> you can find information there. Um, and yeah, find me on social. On social, I'm geeky, sexy love. Um, that kind of encompasses all of my, all of the things that I'm doing. I'm going to have to do the name thing like you and just put it all under my name. <laughs> so that is a perfect segue into what I want to share with my audience that I'm super excited about. But before I do that, um, thank you so much, Jennifer, for being on the show, for being you in the world, for sharing your space with me um, and with my audience. Um, you're delightful. You're a breath of fresh air and sunshine. So um, you're welcome to come play anytime. I am happy to come play anytime. <laughs> I have so much fun with you. Um, all right. So audience, um, first of all, I want you to take a moment to think about what's your relationship with masturbation? Do you feel safe about it? Do you do it because it's a, a replacement for your, you know, partner sex? Do you feel shame about it? Like, what's your relationship with masturbation? Are you like, yeah, I love touching my genitals <laughs> and I feel great about it? Or is there some stuff and some spaces and some blockages that are interfering in that? If so, come hang out with me. And you know how I normally like I do this and this and this and you go here and you go here and you go here. Not anymore. We have a new hub. It's very exciting called All You Need One Stop Shopping. GaiaMorissette.com. Go there. It'll, you can find all the places that I play and the right space that works for you guys. And don't forget to listen to My Orgasmic Life on all of your favorite podcasting platforms. And don't forget to check out Tickle.Life's podcast. Have a juicy day and may it be filled with orgasmic pleasure in any capacity that works for you. I know that's what I'm going to do right now. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>